G'day guys, my name's Dan Wallace and in this episode of the Runner Strive podcast, my guest is Zane Robertson. Now for those of you who don't know or just need a bit of a refresher course, Zane is the national record holder for New Zealand in the half marathon, the marathon and also the 10k on the road, which he jointly holds, funnily enough, with his twin brother Jake. Now, Zane joined me on a call from his home base in Kenya, where he has been since the Tokyo Olympics, where he ran the marathon, finishing 36th in 2.17.04. A few things about this chat. Funnily enough, although Zane's the one in Africa, his audio is great. Mine isn't so great at the start due to some storm technical difficulties. Secondly, as you'll probably figure out pretty quick, Zane and I are very good friends. This comes across as more of a chat between mates than an interview, and I'm hoping that is to your benefit. A few of the things that we chat about in this podcast, Zane takes us behind the scenes of the Tokyo Olympics and how he's been dealing with disappointment since then. We also chat about the different training philosophies between Ethiopia and Kenya. Zane also goes into some of the experimentation with training he did in high school, including running up to four times a day at one stage with his brother, and also a bit of a run through of his track career, which he finished frustratingly in 2014-2015 season, and how he actually wished he went to the marathon sooner. Finally, some of the things we talk about are deciding between the Commonwealth Games and the World Championships next year, of which Zane will hopefully have his pick between. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoy this. If you have any questions for Zane, we're going to chuck up a post and we'll do another Q&A with him at a later time. As always, thanks for listening and without further delay, here is Zane. Um, this is the first podcast you would have done since the Olympics? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> you send me some... <laughs> That's a good answer. Okay. <laughs> just a uh, straight desk. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fair enough. That's accurate. Very, very accurate. Because um, you, <laughs> you sent me some... You sent me some... You know, we like FaceTimed and stuff while you were there. And you sent me some pictures. I'm not going to lie, it looked, a lot of it looked pretty shit where you had to run. Um, and then you finished the race with another, send me another message, which I think ended up as a social media post. You're like, yeah, don't remember the last 10Ks, woke up with a thermometer up my ass. I was like, oh, it's okay. Um, it's like, talk about it. Talk about that, that Olympic experience. Well, yeah, man. Um, fuck the the environment there did not feel like it did not feel like an Olympic Games. It did not feel like a World Championships. It, it didn't feel like a real international event. The only thing that was like keeping some like some competition or some some adrenaline going was the other athletes being around. But we were just locked in a hotel all day um typical japanese hotels quite small rooms um very clean very nice but very small if you're just going to be spending all day in there and then the only place you could actually walk was you had to take a bus from the hotel to the training venue and then you had to walk around the 800 meter loop because there you weren't allowed to walk around the town nowhere it's like we were considered we are the virus and we were treated treated more like prisoners the whole time we were there in Sapporo. And yeah, man, it was it was unmotivating. It was pretty depressing, really. Just didn't want to be there anymore. How long before did you show up? Because I know you did a few sessions with with Malk, Malcolm Hicks, the other um, marathoner. Were you able to get like a bit of training in before the before the actual race? Yeah, we um I flew into Saga, the New Zealand team camp, like uh about 
10 days before we had to go to the Sapporo um, hotel and got some training down there and the heat to acclimatize and all that. Um, it was, it was pretty similar there. We were just in the hotel. We couldn't leave anywhere. We just had to go for training and then come back. But at least the training was more in an open environment. You could run anywhere you wanted. So long runs were possible without just absolute boredom. Um, once we, yeah, once we got to Sapporo, basically we were told that all teams have to be there. All race walk and marathon athletes have to be there eight days before the race. And that meant everybody. That was what the email said. So we thought, or oh, New Zealand's officials thought, oh yeah, we have to follow. We have to follow the rules. Man, Kenya turned up three days before, or two days before the race. Um, same with Belgium. Same with um, some of the other countries. New Zealand and Australia were absolutely screwed. Uh, Japan turned up when they wanted to. It was like. It was not the. It was not an even playing field because we had to train on that concrete loop, which destroyed people's tendons. I still have Achilles pain till now from from that place. I really destroyed my tendons during the race and during the training there. So, pretty pissed off. What about the race itself? Because you you were in the mix. You didn't just go there to you know hang about you got stuck in were you were you proud of how you ran man uh i i I think i made a good effort i i'm proud of my effort you know not every day is going to be a good day Uh, marathon especially the longer the race goes the more chance something can go wrong right especially with the conditions but i'd planned I think my my plan or tactical mistakes, man, if I was in a normal race, it would have been great. Sit on the back of the lead group and drink stations are normally every 5K. But in this race, it was every 3K. And then you've got water stations 500 meters later. And then you've got ice stations again, like 200 meters later. So you want to try and get your your personal bottle then run along and then line up again. If you're in the back of that group, it was like fart because like, most runners would know running a race. And if you're trying to get to a drink st- like station in a big group, you've always, if you're at the front, you can just run, grab your bottle and keep going. But then if you're in behind, you've got to slow down, kind of make your way in, get your bottle, then go out again, come back for water, come back for ice. And doing that three times in 3K, it blew myself to shit. I um, I'd done fart like for twenty eight twenty eight k and was completely dusted. How long did it take you to bounce back? I mean, you said you still got a bit of bit of pain, but um, I know you got some rest and relaxation. Um, it's starting to starting to get back into it. Yeah, yeah. I um, I needed a mental a mental uh, bounce back too because you know I saw like I saw that people I used to beat get medals and stuff so I'm I'm just like questioning everything I don't understand um no like you put a lot you put your whole life and body and soul into this shit and then you don't get any rewards and it's it's hard to take man I I took like two weeks off after the race and started training because the tendons i thought it were were okay it was only the superficial skin that had healed and i thought like it's all good but then when i started training i realized i had some problems and i had to stop start and uh, also cancel my other race of the year los angeles i just went to my favorite place in the world man a beach <laughs> Uh, is that, yeah. is that, but you, you're in, so you, you're in Kenya now, um, and every podcast that ever listened to or interview I've seen with you and your bro are like, 
it's like the same one on repeat. Oh, tell us about how you went to Kenya, blah, blah, blah. I'm not going to do that. We get it. We know. Everyone oh, knows. I know he's Everyone knows. Um, but when I came to see you, you're in Ethiopia. Now you're back in Kenya. What's uh, a lot of people won't really know the difference between like training philosophies and, and groups and systems there. Do you want to talk us through that a little bit? Yeah, okay. Um, well, Ethiopia, the way I've only seen from the capital, um, Addis Ababa, and then the mountain ranges where I used to live, um, Saluta. So there, in Ethiopia, there's basically large groups normally owned by some management or some coach and all the athletes the good athletes all want to go there and train with that group because then they've got a chance to be seen and a chance to also get a manager and race and i mean there's about three or four groups that do good training and then the rest are just a bit crazy but i'd say it's um a lot more structured there like they've got they've got like a team bus they've got they've got their rituals in the morning they've got like their coach in Kenya kind of the the biggest difference would be normally one of the major athletes who would be like the king of the group he would run the program and everyone kind of follows that guy and what he's doing and it seems I, I think it seems to work better for developing knowledge in Kenya because then the athletes kind of adjust to like why they're doing what type of training at what time. Whereas in Ethiopia they're just like, yes, coach, yes, coach. Because they don't they don't ask questions. The coach just says do and and they do. Whereas here the athletes choose what group to go to because it sounds good or the program sounds better. Um, the environment wise, I think Ethiopia is a lot hillier, um, a, lot more, a lot more mountainous, big peaks, steep running, um, higher altitude in general. Um, although I did build a camp here in Kenya at 3,100 meters. Um, so, yeah, we can go and live. We can go and live up there, man, for a little bit if we want to have some fun, run on some hills and get fit, man. Um, it's very hilly up there too. But um, yeah, Eten and Kenya, they normally train on dirt roads on their easy days rather than always forest. Where Ethiopians are always training on the easy days in grass, flat grass, or forest areas. Yeah, I remember catching up with, with some of them on easy days on the grass, some of the guys that I, I had known from here in the States. And I said, oh, you know, what, what long run are you doing? He said, oh, we, we don't do any more than 80 minutes. My coach doesn't believe in doing a long run more than 80 minutes. Oh, I, just, well, I was blown away. But it makes sense from what you've just said that they do what they're told and they kind of don't question it a lot of the time. Yeah. Yeah, man. Um... I think a lot of the top athletes make it to the top because they actually have also a good brain. And brother Colin said it too. He said that he thinks to be a really good athlete, they have to finish school because the brain needs to be working okay. Um, can't just be rubbish all the time. So are you the king of your group? Um. Well, I've gone through phases. I had my camp and I had like uh, 12 guys under me at one point, but um, I didn't get the backing that I wanted. <laughs> this is my cat. Well, well, this well, is, uh... The listeners won't see you. We're not, you're, not, you're not laughing because of what you just said. There's a, cat on, there's a cat on your shoulder. You're like three cats walking around you. <laughs> yeah, I got like three kittens here. One's at my feet and one just jumped onto my shoulder. So... If it was a video podcast, it would be pretty fucking funny. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, cat, uh, the, this is the last thing people would associate with you being a cat man. Cat man, bro. They're like clean animals. Well, they haven't been lately. They've just been shitting all over the house. <laughs> Nightmare, bro. 
just just don't leave your clothes around <laughs> but by the time you're out here they'll be they'll be better disciplined for sure it, let's hope so um I, I was just thinking before too because you, when you're talking about uh training differences and training philosophies i remember so obviously you went to kenya as a kid but i remember when we were in school I and mean, we didn't go to the same school but we we raced each other in high school and that generation that era of us in new zealand we were obsessed with one guy in terms of running that was al garouge that like he was king and <laughs> we're, talk, we're talking dial up internet days i don't know how information got around but I remember being in a North Island cross country and you guys were there and we, we, we were all talking and word got out that you and your brother had found LG's training online, which back then was hard, you know, it's not like it is now. And yeah. a lot of us had done that. A lot of us had found it, but then it, we found out that you guys were actually doing it. You guys were actually <laughs> following it. And we were... We we have everyone we were saying these guys are absolute mad dogs, absolute mad dogs doing allergies <laughs> training. But I, 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 he was the he was the the OG for you, wasn't he? Man, yeah, yeah. Uh, we we did a little bit of everything. We experimented a lot back in the high school era, especially the last two years before leaving. Um, our first coach, uh, Don Willoughby, um, he. He took guidance on us originally, but then as we were growing as athletes, we started finding these programs of the of the greats and we wanted to be like them. So, I mean, why not try and copy programs? I mean, that's a, that's a little bit dumb as well because, you know, we're, there's no way uh, a, like a 15, 16 year old is going to go and do um, 10 400s with 30 second recoveries and 54s. <laughs> <laughs> but um so i started to learn that like, just okay just adjust the pace because it's called race pace training so it means adjust the pace to your race pace and yeah we we went through a period of um training three times trying to do four times a day um you know going through the phase of more is better doing drills until you can't walk uh, <laughs> um one evening one evening our mom lost her shit because jake would jake would go out for his run and i'd go out for mine i came back he wasn't back so i went out again then jake came back in that time and i was out so he went out again i got back he wasn't he was gone i went out for hill work and yeah, the next morning I remember walking to school wasn't so good, man. Like <laughs> the legs were completely toast. Well, in that in that era too, it was you were associated with like you you ran the fifteen hundred and Jake ran the five K, like longer. That's that's how it kind of seemed. But then you ended up running some outrageously good 1500s not that long ago. But I also remember you saying you, you felt like you could have gone a lot faster, um, that, you, that you could have knocked on the door of kind of that low 330s. Talk, talk about that. Yeah. Oh, man. The last year of my track life, um, very memorable year, but also – so many, so many things in sport come down to politics and just who's your management. Um, also, like 1500 or any track race, it's just tactical errors. You know, you make a mistake and you lose three seconds. Um, so I'll run through a few of my last track races and the whole, the whole story behind it and why I think I could have run faster. Um, so... The year was 2014 and I went with my my group that I was coaching as well at the time and we went to one of the local Kenyan races which is in Momius. It's about it's about 1700 meters altitude, a little bit humid there and dirt track and 
we always used to do this every year as like a, a warm up race and for for the international season. Um, we stay the night in the hotel on Friday and Saturday morning. We warm up to the to to the track and there's no schedule. You just get there and then they'll tell you in the morning what race is when. And they told told me that the five k was at uh at, at like eleven. It ended up being at eleven thirty, but we'd warmed up and we were ready, laced up, and I ended up winning it. Uh, first, I think first non African like non Kenyan to ever win a race in Kenya, but um, the fifteen hundred was meant to be later in the evening, and. It, I was warming down from the 5k and I'd run 1346 and they my guys came running out and saying hey man 1500s are on the track <laughs> you better get back in if you want to run <laughs> and uh okay man I was like well me and two other of my guys were like oh shit yeah let's go we ran and put our spikes on I got in heat toe and I ended up coming I ended up coming third 343 and it's still not bad for altitude in a dirt track uh, but it really suggested like shape is there and i'm um, gonna do big things in the international season so i overtrained a little bit in the next few weeks and with all the confidence in the world i went to shanghai and absolutely bombed i ran like 13 30 something and I knew that I was getting tired and I knew that I didn't feel good anymore. And then I went to a few more races. I went to Ostrava 3K. I went to Oslo and none of them I felt great. And I ran pretty, pretty average, pretty slow. And I was, I was like really questioning what's up now. What should I do? I, I flew out to St. Moritz and I stopped racing. I trained for about five weeks. And I got my shit back together. I ended up going to a race in Ireland, Cork. Cork followed by Dublin. And it was a 3K followed by a mile. And I ran about, I ran 7.41 in a windy, windy track. Not a diamond league or anything. Then I think it was two or three days later, I ran a 3.53 mile. And that was the mile where Will Lear ran 350. And I just feel like in the back straight, when I was making my move, I was kicking up the inside in lane one. Someone stepped completely back in on me. So I had to stop while Will Lear was starting to move away. And I couldn't, I just had to come out again at 150 to go and start again, which was really hard. I think I did lose about three to four seconds. So 349 mile was definitely possible that night. Um, but moving on to the next race opportunity where I think a 1250 something was possible for 5k. Uh, I don't know why I was put in the B race, but I think again, it comes down to who's your management. So they put me in the B race and I decided not to go. I decided not to leave St. Moritz, just train and go to Commonwealth games there and ended up winning my bronze medal. After Commonwealth, I went on to what was again training block because while the American athletes had all heard what races they were running, like Zurich, Brussels, Stockholm, the 5Ks, they knew what was coming. I had nothing lined up. My management would just tell me, man, Commonwealth Games don't matter. Um, you're not American, so it's hard to get you in. So I just started training. I was training like an absolute madman. I did a session of five times 800 and five times 300 with 70 second rests between the 800s. And I think the slowest was like a 201 and the fastest was a 157. Um, the 300s were like 43 to 40, nothing special. But I got home from that session. And my manager called me and said, hey, uh, yeah, do you want to race in Stockholm? 5,000. I was like, yeah, yes, I do. But isn't that like after tomorrow? And he's like, yeah, yeah, it is. I said, dude, do you know that I'm fucking training? I'm not just here jogging and doing strides. 
Like I just killed myself. So I just told him, send me because you, you never win if you don't take an opportunity. Right. So I just had to take it. Ended up flying, flying out the next morning, slept the night there. The next day I raced and, uh, I went out pretty hard. I went through 3K and 743 right on the pacemakers. And about a lap later, I blew, blew to shit, ran my last mile super slow because I ran a 1326 or something like that. It was, it was due to happen, due to happen. But I really, really hate the, the stories of my track career because it's like I still don't have the 5,000 national record. Um, I didn't get close enough to the 1500 national record. I definitely could have, I think I could have done both. But do you think you would have run? So that's 2014, and then 2015, you break 60 for the half. So I know you didn't run as fast as you wanted over the five or the 15, but that training that you did, do you, surely that helped you to then break 60 and a half yeah i think i think the speed training always comes in handy and i always try to revert back to that before my marathons as well just so the body doesn't remember and get lazy um i would always join the marathon group at the end of my track season so it was the second year doing it in ethiopia and i would um I would come back to Ethiopia, do one or two weeks alone, just build up the altitude, um, feel good again, and then I'd go and join the group. And I feel like if I'd run in November 2014 in New Delhi, I would have run very low 59 half. Um, two reasons. One, because it's a faster course, it's a fast race, and it's paced. Um, and also the second reason because I was just in better shape. Like it didn't take me long to tap into that endurance off my speed training. And it never really does. I think I come back from injuries way faster than normal people. I don't know why it just happens. It's, it's the same for both Jake and me. Um, and yeah, man, I, I mean, I was training my ass off and I kind of went out of shape again. I, I pushed a little bit too much got flat kind of was taking the rest of the year off and then I decided to change management finally I I joined uh, another management manager and I went to Bo Classic man race you're familiar with and uh well he called me up and actually gave me like hope of racing so I put my foot down again started training I got third man I um I was in the sprint finish with Merga and Mukta Idris and I ended up getting third. And then he, he called me a week later and was like, Hey Zane, uh, we have a half marathon in three weeks time in Japan. So if you're interested, they're not paying a lot for you to come, but if you want to run a half, it's probably your last opportunity this, this season before you go back to the track. And I was, I was just like, you know what? Things have been going well again. Okay, fuck yeah. Put me in. And, uh, oh man, I went back to Ethiopia for three and a half weeks with the group and things ended up going not so bad over there. Was that the, um, did you go back to the marathon group? Yeah, I went back to the marathon group because I knew that, yeah. It was, a, it was a place, I always used to say Kenya for track and Ethiopia for road. That was my theory on it because I had a good group there for road training or marathon. And I had a great, great system over here for track where I could largely depend on myself and get things done over here my, on my own. So you started the year training for the 1500 and... I know the, the half marathon was kind of early the next year. Bo Classic was the end of 2014, but you've then, you know, finished that season breaking 60. When did the marathon then come into your mind? Um, 
Man, I actually wish I actually wish I should have done it a lot sooner. I wish um I think I would have been ready in 2015 to run a marathon. So I kind of wish that I'd gone at the end of the year to somewhere like Chicago or even as soon as London that year, 20, 2015. Because London wanted me to come and be a pacer. But if they knew I was ready to run a marathon and I'd just put my foot down and said, okay, track, track, you're gone. Um, let's go to the marathon. Um, yeah, I think it would have been a good, good, good move at that point. I think it's pretty unfair to, I mean, you're the national record holder, but I don't see you as a, just a marathoner. I mean, I still see you as being able to go to just about any distance and run fast. Is that something that you're, you're thinking about or are you just going to, are you just sticking to the marathon now? I think, yeah, if, if I really wanted to go back to the track and there was also enough financial gain from it because it's our only job. So Hmm. I can't live without money and, also the risk of getting injured while training for track there's a risk wherever you go but weighing up marathon and track yeah it definitely has to be marathon now um i think i can run fast on any distance it's just putting in the work in the right way again got to earn that money to pay for that cat food i can hear those cats purring <laughs> yeah yeah they're on my feet oh shit um Bro, so we're exactly. coming up to we're coming up to I mean end of the year. Next year is a few big championships on and it's probably pretty premature to be, you know, asking you, but I'm going to anyway. Um the cats are fighting, biting each other's <laughs> neck. Um yeah. would you would you rather do Tom Games or World Champs? Um yeah, tough decision because we're waiting. We're waiting to hear back from. I don't know if it was a government thing or if it was a whole new referendum of like, what do you get if you get get a medal? My only goal, I would rather do Commonwealth Games, and my only goal would be to win a gold medal there. I don't want a silver. I don't want a bronze. I just want the gold medal. But to do that over a marathon where you could go to a world marathon major and you could go to another race, get an appearance fee, get some money. There has to be some benefit. And I just can't imagine um, any companies in New Zealand putting in sponsorships for, for, for me winning that gold. I can't imagine the financial benefit being great now because the country's in debt because they keep locking the country down. Um, there's a, there's a whole lot going on which will make my decision clearer for me in the months to come but first thing is just do the training kind of get back into a good shape and then realize where to go from there you know makes sense i mean a world champs in america too lots of um Lots of, you know, lots of eyes, home, home of track and field. Um, I mean, well, it's in, in Portland, won't it? Oh, is it Eugene? No, we with the marathon there talking about Portland. Is that, do you know anything about that? Yeah, I, I, I heard a rumour that they were going to make it a, a loop down in Portland or somewhere. But um, that, that would be pretty cool. I just, um, I would just have to weigh up the options, you know, because I still need to qualify for either of them and I that means I need to run another race beforehand so I always just go one race at a time if it's a marathon and the first race up has to be has to be somewhere in the early next year is it points or or time um they don't make it easy to understand do they no man i don't understand the system it's definitely time just one hit wonder for me 
focus. I'm not going to go and do these points things like running the Oceana Championship Marathon. I'm not going to go and do all this New Zealand Marathon Champs shit. And first off, to get into the country is impossible. So how can they even have a New Zealand Marathon Championships? And their best runners are overseas. Um, you just got to spend two weeks in a, in a hotel. Yeah, exactly. Man, um, yeah, I mean, I'm fully vaccinated anyway, so who gives a shit? I actually like how they've done it over here. They just kind of walk around and life goes on. <laughs> Get hard, right, man? Well, it seems to be, um, I mean, you're, you're obviously you're obviously healthy, so you're able to to think about training it training your head you like you said you, you'll plan for a marathon and, and then and then see what happens yeah yeah um do, yeah i can't i can't name names over i'll tell you personally what's up but uh there's there's three or four that i'm looking at yeah yeah okay. well then maybe there always has Sorry, bro. Oh, no, Go no, on. no, 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 it's all good. I, I understand that you, you know, still got decisions to make, but um, maybe, maybe the next podcast we'll do, you'll be able to, you'll be able to drop it on us. Oh, yeah. Let's do one when you're out here. Yeah. All right, bro. Well, I'll, I'll leave it there. I'll, I'll leave it the there. Internet that's, works. Probably, that's probably, um, yeah, that well, works better than Ethiopian, that's for sure. But um Fuck yes. I'll, I'll leave it there. Thanks thanks to your time, mate. You gotta go look after those cats. They look like they're about to start um killing each other. But uh <laughs> yeah, we'll 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 chat we'll, we'll chat again soon.